Okay. But for now, I want to talk about a few models of universe expansion that kind of grow out of this idea that Hubble's constant isn't always the same number over time. All right. So we know that the universe was expanding in the past and has been expanding for its entire history. We can measure that that expansion is faster now than it was in the past. And so what we want to do is create a model that tells us how the universe will behave in the future, right? So I think of this kind of like as fortune telling. We can build a model and this is our crystal ball of how the universe might end or whether the universe will end. And there are four basic models. Um, the book categorizes into them into four, but you can, I mean, there's a whole continuum of models. And so these are just four particular curves or shapes that you can draw that have a particular meaning. Two of these models are decelerating, which means that the expansion has, um, you know, increased and then it will eventually decrease. Um, here, the rate of the expansion decreases slowly. Here, it decreases quickly. There could be a coasting universe where essentially the expansion rate is always the same. Or you could have an accelerating universe where the expansion gets faster and faster over time. So these are the four models. And this is just one representation of these four models. And what the representation is trying to show is, you know, we're starting down here with a big bang. And then the flat object is meant to be our universe. And the size of that object is meant to show how much it has stretched. So this is, you know, simplifying our three dimensional universe to a two dimensional ring circle, I guess. And then this is just following from the past to the future in time. So that's how to read this plot is how has the universe expanded and contracted and the present moment is highlighted by these yellow boxes. All right. I say all of this because I found this to be a rather confusing graph at first. And um, all of these models depend on how much stuff there is in the universe. So how much matter and how much dark energy, because as we mentioned in the last slide, those two things are essentially competing to influence the overall expansion. All right, so this brings us to the idea of density of stuff. And this is the amount of mass in a given volume, but we're gonna extend this idea of density to include energy density as well. So that's the amount of energy in a given volume. So that means that not only are we counting all the regular stuff around us, but we're also counting all of the light that's called radiation. And so that has an equivalent mass. And then we also consider dark energy. So how can we do this? It's because um, we know that energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. So there is an equivalence between mass and energy. Um, this came up when we were talking about nuclear fusion in astronomy 122. Um, and essentially it says that you can create energy given a certain amount of mass. It doesn't take a lot of mass to create lots of energy because the speed of light squared is a very, very big number. All right, but for our purposes here, it means that we can consider all the light energy that exists in the entire universe and come up with an equivalent amount of mass. So we treat everything as if it's mass. And once we have the equivalent mass of everything in the universe, then we divide that by the entire volume of the whole universe and that gives us the overall density. So when we talk about density for the universe, we're talking about mass plus energy density. And the, what we wanna know is how the actual measured density of the universe compares to a theoretical critical density. Um, this is big Greek letter omega, capital omega. So omega naught tells us what the critical density is and how those two densities compare actual versus critical tells us which model, which pathway our universe will take. All right, so I'm gonna try to walk through a new representation of those four models, but now we're gonna put it on this particular graphic representation. So what we're looking at here is the size of the universe versus time. And this dashed line will represent our present day. And so um, if our density is zero, so if there's nothing in the universe, no matter, no energy, uh, but it's just an empty space expanding um, at a constant rate with the Hubble constant that we measure today, then that's represented by this dashed line. 
and essentially following this dashed line back to this point where it intersects the time axis gives us the Hubble time T naught. So the idea here is that there's nothing in the universe to slow the expansion down and the universe just continues coasting to an infinite size. So because it's coasting, because it has a constant uh, expansion rate, then this is called a coasting universe. Um, but we know that this model can't be true because there's stuff in the universe, right? And we also know that the Hubble constant changes with time. So a straight line cannot represent that. There has to be some sort of curvature in this line if the Hubble constant is changing over time. Because what a constant Hubble constant would mean is a straight line, right? That's what we've assumed so far. So that's already the familiar case. But it turns out that that's not true as we've seen. So we know that this can't be the, the right curve. Um, so there are some other options. Let's say that we have a critical density universe. So the actual density is equal to this omega naught critical density. In that case, we can see that um, the expansion is slowing down. And eventually in the very far future, the universe will stop expanding, but only at an infinite time. So that's the, the critical density case. It tells us that over time, the density or the expansion will um, slow and slow and slow until eventually we reach a maximum size. But you never exactly get there. It's what we call asymptotic. So this type of universe, for reasons that we'll see in a moment, is called a flat universe. So black dash line was um, coasting universe. This purple line is our flat universe. And now let's consider what happens when we have more than the critical density. So more than the critical density means we have lots of gravity pulling strongly in against expansion. And so because of that high mass density, high energy density, the expansion eventually stops and the universe contracts back to a zero size. So in that scenario, the universe ends in a, what we call a big crunch. And this particular type of universe is called closed uh, because it comes back on, in on itself. Um, this also relates to the geometry of space-time. I'll tell you about that in a second. So um, if you've ever taken a physics class, but don't worry if you haven't, you'll notice that this sort of parabola also resembles um, like the pathway of a projectile. So like if I throw a ball, then it gets farther away and then it collapses back down toward the ground. And you can think of this scenario as kind of similar to that, um, that gravity eventually pulls the object with initial velocity v naught back in on itself. Okay, so in case that's helpful to anyone. Okay, so considering our higher than critical density universe ends in a big crunch, which image should this correspond to? Yep, so universe A is the only one that ends up back at the same singular point. And so uh, image A would be the big crunch universe. So this is a decelerating universe. It has higher than the critical density. Okay, let's consider what happens when we have less than the critical density. So in this case, uh, the expansion slows over time, but it never comes to a stop, not even at infinite time. So it just continues to expand slower and slower forever and ever and ever. Um, and so this universe gets bigger forever. Uh, and so therefore it's called an open universe. So it's, it's decelerating, it's expanding slower and slower over time, but it never stops expanding. So this universe gets all the way up to infinite size at infinite time. And there's one more option, which is kind of a wild and wacky one, where you have less than the critical density, but you also have a whole lot of dark energy. And so in this case, the expansion happens not slower and slower and slower forever, but faster and faster and faster forever. And so this universe blows up to an extremely infinite size. Uh, this is called an open or an accelerating universe because the expansion is now accelerating instead of decelerating. And so, yes, this is, this is I think, the wildest curve shape possibility. 
Um, and you'll notice that this particular curve only works if it hasn't always been accelerating. So that's why this curve has a, a particular strange shape. There's some deceleration early on and then there's acceleration far in the future. All right, so here are all four of those models on a single plot. And so we've got curve one was our above critical density, curve three is our critical density, curve two is below, and curve four is also below, but also contains lots of dark energy. So the balance of regular matter and radiation to dark energy, that is something that can change in these models. And so that's the difference between curve two and curve four. There's many other possible curves. You can draw basically an infinite number of possibilities. And by measuring the expansion rate and the density, that is how we can choose between which one of these four curves is the most likely one for our own universe. So here again, um, the dashed line um, has Hubble time of T naught, that's around 14 billion years. And you'll notice that all of these other curves hit the time axis at different points, meaning they have different ages relative to the T naught age that we got from the Hubble constant. And we can measure the age of the universe independently through other means, right? We can measure how old are the oldest stars, for example, and that'll give us some limits on which one of these times could be most likely. So it's not only that we have to know the, um, the A or the, sorry, the expansion rate and the density, but also it helps to know um, the age of different things in the universe. And this is why we're so interested in galaxy formation and when galaxy formation could have happened because it helps us to distinguish between these four models. I'm not gonna give away that model right away. Um, and instead, I'm gonna come back to this idea that we have to measure what density that we have, all right? And this will lead us to which one of these models best matches our universe. 